Hello there and welcome to the Unit 2 review video for AP Psychology. My name is Mr. Sin and today we are going to be reviewing everything you need to know about Unit 2 of AP Psychology, Biological Basis of Behavior. Now before we get started, I need you to go get the study guide that goes with this video. To do this, you need to go click the link in the description of this video and go to my ultimate review packet. There you'll find a study guide that goes along with this entire video. In the packet, you'll also find an answer key to the study guide, unit practice quizzes, practice AP tests, and other review resources for every single unit of AP Psychology. I created the Ultimate Review Packet to review all the major concepts in AP Psychology and the major concepts that would be covered in an Introduction to Psychology class in college. All this is to not only help you get an A in your AP Psychology class, but also a 5 on the national exam in May. This unit review video is going to go fast. Make sure you have your study guide out and ready to go. Remember, if you miss any information, you can always check the answer key that's in the Ultimate Review Packet. Or you can go back and re-watch my topic review videos on YouTube that go into more detail for each topic. Unit 2 starts with the interaction of heredity and environment. Remember, heredity is the passing on of different physical and mental traits from one generation to another. Individuals such as Charles Darwin focused on understanding how heredity and environment impacted an individual. Darwin created a theory of evolution which stated that evolution happens by natural selection. Individual traits that are beneficial to a species' survival would be passed on, while undesirable traits would die off. Now, in talking about heredity, we also need to understand what heredability is. Remember, this is a mathematical measure to estimate how much variation there is in a population related to its genes. This shows us how much of a trait is genetics and how much of it is from the environment. For example, if the heritability of a trait is 0.6, that means that 60% of the variations for that trait in the population is caused by genetics, and 40% is due to the environment. Heritabilities can range anywhere from 0 to 1. We can see that individual traits have influences from both nature and nurture. For years, people have argued that it is nature, our genetics, biology, and heredity that shape us as individuals, while others have argued that it's our nurture, our environment, how we're raised, what friends we had, the amount of education we had access to, or how much wealth we had, and other environmental factors that shaped us as individuals. We can see that different psychological perspectives stand on different sides of this debate. For example, individuals such as Charles Darwin would lean more towards the nature side of the debate. We can look at the study of epigenetics, which focuses on how the environment and a person's behavior affect a person's genes and how they work. Here the focus is on an individual's body reads a DNA sequence. The DNA itself is not changing. Epigenetics happens slowly. Here, different genes are essentially being turned on or off due to a sustained environmental pressure. So we can see that when it comes to influences over our development, there is truth in both the nature and nurture side of the debate. We will see this even more clearly when we go into reciprocal determinism in Unit 7, which looks at how the environment and an individual's behavior and also their individual feelings and beliefs all impact each other. Standard 2 of Unit 2 is all about the endocrine system, which is made up of all the body's different glands that produce different hormones. This helps regulate our different biological processes. The endocrine system and our nervous system allow our bodies to function and send information throughout our entire body. Now, I mentioned the endocrine system and the nervous system. It's important to remember that these are two different systems. The nervous system uses neurons to send and deliver messages to localized areas of the body. It uses fast, short-lived messages. While the endocrine system uses glands to create hormones, these are slower-moving messages, and they target large, broad areas of the body. Before we get into the different glands and hormones of the endocrine system, I want to quickly review the concept of homeostasis. This is a term that will come up not just throughout this unit, but also in later units as well. Homeostasis is the body's ability to maintain internal stability. For example, your body will maintain a body temperature around 98 degrees Fahrenheit. If your body gets too hot or too cold and leaves homeostasis, it will work to move your body back to homeostasis. Now, the endocrine system is made up of a variety of different glands. For this part of the video, make sure you complete the table in your study guide. You want to understand not only where the different glands are located, but also what their function is and what hormones are associated with the gland. Starting out, we have the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain that controls the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus directs different autonomic functions of the body, and it directs the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland releases growth hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin. This gland communicates with other glands around the body to produce their hormones, and is sometimes referenced as the master gland. 
gland. Above the brain stem, in the middle of the brain, is the pineal gland, which helps regulate sleep cycles. This gland produces melatonin, which helps you fall asleep at night. Moving down into the throat, we have the thyroid and the parathyroid gland, which help regulate an individual's metabolism, growth, nervous system, and regulate calcium levels in your blood. Hormones here would include thyroid hormones, parathyroid hormones, and calcitonin, just to name a few. Just above the kidney sits the adrenal glands, which help regulate salt levels, blood pressure, and oxygen intake. Here, hormones produced are norepinephrine, epinephrine, and aldosterone. If we look near your stomach, we can see the pancreas, which produces insulin and glucagon. This helps regulate an individual sugar levels. Lastly, we have the gonads, which are the ovaries or testes. This is where testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone are produced. This is what allow individuals to be able to reproduce. Moving to 2.3, we can see that we have the nervous system, which is made up of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The CNS is made up of the brain and spinal cord. It sends out orders to the body, while the PNS consists of different nerves that branch off the brain and spine. This is what allows the nervous system to communicate with the rest of the body. Remember, the central nervous system sends messages through the peripheral nervous system to tell the body what to do. And the peripheral nervous system can send messages back to the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system can be broken down into the sensory division and also motor division. The sensory division is also known as the afferent division, which focuses on conducting impulses from sensory stimuli to the central nervous system. While the motor division, also known as the efferent division, has signals that come from the brain and spinal cord and go out to the muscles and glands of your body through the efferent neuron. Remember, afferent neurons send signals to the brain and spinal cord, while efferent neurons send messages from the brain and spinal cord to the body. If you need help remembering this, try to remember that afferent approaches the brain and efferent exits the brain. A for approach and E for exit. Now the motor division includes the somatic and autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system, also known as the skeletal nervous system, includes your five senses and skeletal muscle movements. These movements happen consciously and voluntarily, while the autonomic nervous system controls involuntary activities. This is what makes sure your heart keeps beating, your stomach keeps digesting, and you keep breathing. The autonomic nervous system can be broken down into two parts, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. The sympathetic division mobilizes your body and gets it ready for action. This makes your heart beat faster, your eyes dilate, and increases your breathing. While the parasympathetic division relaxes the body, it slows your heart rate, increases your digestion, and helps you start to focus on storing energy. Both of these work together in emergencies to help with your fight or flight response. Now the nervous system is supported by glial cells. These cells provide neurons with nutrients and are the most abundant cell in the nervous system. One thing to remember about glial cells is they do not process any information, meaning that they do not send any messages or signals for your body. Lastly, we have to break down the neuron, which is the basic functional unit of the nervous system. We can see that neurons communicate with each other by using electrical and chemical signals to send information throughout our entire nervous system. Now, in order to value your time and to make sure that these videos maximize your studying, I'm not going to break down each part of the neuron. However, you do need to understand the different parts of a neuron. Right now, what I need you to do is complete the last part of the study guide for 2.3. Identify the different parts of the neuron and their functions. Once you're done, you can check your answers in the study guide in the ultimate review packet. Then come back to this video and we'll go over 2.4. This part of unit two is all about how neurons communicate and send signals between different neurons. In order for neurons to send a message, they need to receive enough stimulation that causes an action potential. An action potential is when a neuron fires and sends an impulse down the axon. In order for this to happen, a couple things need to occur. You have in your body positively charged and negatively charged ions. Your cell membranes separate the ions and create an environment on either side of the barrier that is overall positive or negative. This is what gives your neurons potential. Some ions are able to cross the membrane more easily than others, which is a trait known as permeability. When a neuron is not sending a signal, it has more negative ions inside than outside. This is called resting potential. To trigger an action potential, a neuron must depolarize, which happens when an outside stimulus is strong enough to meet the threshold that causes depolarization to occur. If the 
the stimulus does not meet the threshold, there is no firing, and the neuron will return to its resting state. Remember, it's an all or nothing game here. The neuron will only fire if the threshold is met. When an action potential occurs, it sends a signal down the axon to other neurons in the nervous system. After that, the neuron goes through a process of repolarization, which brings the neuron back to resting potential. During this process, channels will be open to try and rebalance the charges by letting more positive ions back outside the cell membrane. When this is happening and the signal is moving down a neuron's axon, the neuron cannot respond to any other stimulus. This is known as a refractory period, which is a time period where the cell cannot fire and it needs to wait until the repolarization process occurs and the cell goes back to a resting potential. Now, once the signal makes its way down the axon of a neuron, it's sent down to the axon terminal, where the signal is converted and sent to another neuron through a small pocket of space between the axon terminal of one neuron and the dendrite of another neuron. This tiny space is known as the synapse. Speaking of synapses, we can see here that there are chemical synapses and electrical synapses. Chemical synapses use neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers. They send messages through the nervous system. Electrical synapses are for messages that need to be sent quickly and immediately. When neurotransmitters are sent, they diffuse through the synaptic gap to deliver their messages. The synaptic gap is a narrow space between two neurons, specifically the presynaptic terminal of one neuron and the postsynaptic terminal of another neuron. The presynaptic terminal is the axon terminal of the neuron, which converts the electrical signal to a chemical one and sends the neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap, while the postsynaptic terminal is where the neurotransmitters are accepted in the dendrites of the receiving neuron. Remember, pre means before and post means after. Presynaptic is before and postsynaptic is after. Now, once the neurotransmitters have passed their messages onto the postsynaptic neuron, they will unbind with the receptors. Some of the neurotransmitters are destroyed and others get reabsorbed. The process of taking excess neurotransmitters that are left in the synaptic gap is known as reuptake. This is when the sending neuron reabsorbs the extra neurotransmitter. Depending on what neurotransmitters bind to which receptors, we can see that the neuron will either get excited or inhibited. Excitatory neurotransmitters will increase the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential through the depolarization process in the postsynaptic neuron, while inhibitory neurotransmitters will decrease the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential. This leads to hyperpolarization to occur, which is when the inside of the neuron becomes more negative, which moves it farther away from its threshold or intensity level needed for an action potential. When trying to remember this chain of events, try to remember them in the following order. One, we have an action potential that sends a signal down the axon of a neuron to the presynaptic terminal. Two, the channels in the axon terminal are open and the neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic gap. This is for chemical messages. Three, the neurotransmitters diffuse through the synaptic gap and bind to receptor sites in the postsynaptic terminal. And four, neurotransmitters unbind with the receptors, some are destroyed, and others go through the process of reuptake. Lastly, it's going to be important that you remember the different types of neurotransmitters and what they do to the body. Acetylcholine enables muscle action, learning, and helps with memory. Dopamine helps with movement, learning, attention, and emotion. Serotonin impacts an individual's hunger, sleep, arousal, and mood. Endorphins help with pain control and impacts an individual's pain tolerance. Epinephrine helps with the body's response to high emotional situations and helps form memory, while norepinephrine increases your blood pressure, heart rate, and alertness. Both epinephrine and norepinephrine work together with the body's fight or flight response. Glutamate is involved with long-term memory and learning. Lastly, GABA helps with sleep, movement, and slows down your nervous system. 2.5 is all about drugs and their impact on neural firing. Also, before we start this section, I want to give a quick shout out to my Discord server. It's an awesome place where you can study with thousands of students around the world. It's free and you can find the link in the description down below. We're going to start by quickly reviewing the difference between agonist and antagonist drugs. Agonist drugs increase the effectiveness of a neurotransmitter, while antagonist drugs decrease the effectiveness of a neurotransmitter. Agonists bind to the receptors that are in the synapse that are for neurotransmitters. These substances increase the effectiveness of the neurotransmitter by mimicking them and increasing the production of the neurotransmitter, or by blocking the reuptake that would usually absorb the extra neurotransmitters. This makes them more available in the synapse. Antagonist drugs, on the other hand, work in multiple ways. They either block the neurotransmitters from being released from the presynaptic axon terminal, or they connect to the postsynaptic receptors and block the intended neurotransmitters from binding. Examples of agonist substances would be anti-anxiety medication, such as Xanax, which increases the neurotransmitter known as GABA, which decreases neural activity and can calm people down. Another example would be Prozac, which is used to treat depression. This agonistic substance delays the reuptake 
intake of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, making it more available for the body to use. Opioids would be another example of an agonist substance. Examples of antagonist substances would be medication for schizophrenia, which blocks dopamine receptors, or alcohol, which blocks the release of glutamate, which acts as a depressant for our nervous system. And you're on to 2.6. This part of Unit 2 is all about different structures of the brain. Now, this part of the video is going to be going fast, so make sure you have your study guide out, as we're about to go over the different structures of the brain. If you need more information on any of these structures, make sure to check out my Unit 2 Topic 6 review video on YouTube. That goes into a lot more detail for each of these different structures. Also, speaking of YouTube, if you're finding value in this video or any of my other videos, consider subscribing. It's free and it's a great way to support the channel. Starting with Broca's area, we can see that this area of the brain is in charge of facial muscles that are used to help us speak. This area was first identified by Paul Broca. If this area of the brain is ever damaged, an individual will experience Broca's aphasia, which is the loss in ability to produce language. Next is Wernicke's area, which was discovered by Carl Wernicke. This is an area in the brain which is responsible for creating meaningful speech. If this part of the brain is ever damaged, a person will lose the ability to create meaningful speech. This is known as Wernicke's aphasia. The medulla oblongata is right above the spinal cord and below the pons. This helps regulate a person's cardiovascular and respiratory system. It takes care of autonomic function. The pons is the bridge between different areas of the nervous system. It connects the medulla with the cerebellum and helps to coordinate movement. One of the main functions of the pons is to help with sleep and dream. The cerebellum is located at the base of the brain in the back and it allows you to maintain balance and manage your coordination. The brain stem is located at the base of your brain and at the top of the spinal cord. It includes the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. If it's ever severely damaged, it will most likely result in death since it controls autonomic function. Speaking of the spinal cord, this is what connects your brain to the rest of your body. Think about this as the information highway. This allows for your nerves to send information to your brain and vice versa. The midbrain helps with sending visual and auditory information to the appropriate structures of the brain. You can think about this part of the brain as a relay station. The reticular formation is a structure of the brain that tunnels down the brainstem. Its main function is arousal in the sleep and awake cycle. While the reticular activating system encompasses the reticular formation, it's a network of nerves that run through the brainstem and out to the thalamus. This helps stimulate higher centers when something important happens. That needs to have immediate attention. Now so far we've been talking about the midbrain and also the hindbrain, which mainly focus on involuntary functions. The next structures we're going to be talking about are part of the forebrain. The cerebrum is the name of the brain parts that are not the brainstem and the cerebellum. Here is where the brain processes information that's not just for survival, things like complex thought. The cerebral cortex is a thin layer of billions of nerve cells that cover the whole brain. Inside the cerebral cortex is the corpus callosum, which is made up of nerve fibers that connect the two cerebral hemispheres. This allows your hemispheres to talk and communicate with one another. Remember, the cerebral cortex can be broken down into four different lobes and two different hemispheres. The frontal lobe is located behind your forehead. It deals with higher level thinking and is separated into two important areas. The prefrontal cortex deals with foresight, judgment, speech, and complex thought, while the motor cortex deals with voluntary movement and is located in the back of the frontal lobe. Remember, the left motor cortex controls movement on the right side of your body, and the right motor cortex controls movement on the left side of your body. Visually, we can see the functions of the motor cortex represented by the motor homunculus, which shows a visual representation of the amount of brain area that is dedicated towards a specific body part. The parietal lobe sits on top of your head, right behind the frontal lobe. Here, the main function is to receive sensory information. This is what lets you understand different sensations, such as touch, pain, temperature, and spatial orientation. The somatosensory cortex, on the other hand, is parallel and touches the motor cortex. This part of the parietal lobe allows you to register touch and movement, sensations as well. The left sensory cortex controls sensations for the right side of your body, while the right sensory cortex controls sensations for the left part of your body. Speaking of sensory information, we can visualize the amount of brain area that is dedicated towards specific body parts when looking at the sensory homunculus. Moving to the back of our head, we have the occipital lobe and the visual cortex, which is what allows you to be able to see. The temporal lobe is located right above your ears. This helps you recognize faces, smell, hear noises, balance, and assist with memory. This is also where Wernicke's area is located. Also located in the temporal lobe is the angular gyrus, which allows you to read words on a paper and transfer that information into an auditory form. There's also the auditory cortex that's located in the temporal lobe. This is what processes different sounds that you hear. Speaking of sensory information, we also have the thalamus, which takes all the different sensory information that you take in every second and sends that information to the forebrain to be interpreted. 
Next, we have the limbic system, which is a group of structures between the brainstem and the cerebral cortex. The main function here is emotions, learning, memory, and some of our basic drive. Surrounding the thalamus and inside the temporal lobes, we have the hippocampus. This area allows you to create memories. This is how we learn and form memories. Remember though, this is where memories are created, but they're not stored here. The amygdala is a structure located at the end of each arm of the hippocampus. These two round clusters are where you get your emotional reactions from. You can thank your amygdala for your fear, anxiety, and also aggression. Next is the hypothalamus, which is what keeps your body balanced. This allows you to have homeostasis and is what controls your drive, such as thirst, hunger, temperature, and sex. This also works with the pituitary gland to regulate and control your hormones. Then there is the nucleus accumbens, which is located near the limbic system and is associated with drug dependency. Its main function is with pleasure and reward and motivation. Lastly, we have the basal ganglia. These neuron cell bodies are involved in intentional body movement. They link the thalamus with the motor cortex. If this area is damaged, it could lead to Parkinson's, cerebral palsy, or Huntington's disease. Now remember, when looking at the brain, we can see that there are three major regions. The hindbrain is located at the bottom of the brain. The midbrain is up from the base of the brain and is surrounded by the forebrain. And the forebrain, which is on the top of the brain, is what most people visualize when they think about the brain. Today, we know that the brain uses brain lateralization, which is the differing functions of the left and right hemisphere. Essentially, it's the division of labor between the two hemispheres. Each hemisphere has different areas that it's more efficient in. At the end of the day, we all use both hemispheres to accomplish different tasks, and no one is simply just right or left brain. Now, we can see that the brain does have some hemispheric specialization, which we can see with the left brain, for example, which is better at recognizing words, interpreting language, while the right hemisphere is a little bit better at spatial concepts, such as facial recognition and discerning direction. All right, now that we've talked about the different brain structures, it's time to look at how we can examine the brain. Before we get into neuroimaging techniques, though, I want to talk about Phineas Gage and split brain research. Both are unique and have helped us better understand the brain and its function. Phineas Gage was a railroad worker who was injured when a tampering rod shot clean through his head. Now, the crazy part of this story is that Phineas Gage he lived. He even walked away from the accident without any cognitive defect. But Phineas Gage did have a pretty severe personality change, and it was discovered that it was because the rod had severed his limbic system and his prefrontal cortex was damaged. Remember, these areas are important for judgment and emotional regulation. Roger Sperry and Michael Gonzaga became known for their work with split brain research. This is a procedure that was done to help treat people with severe epilepsy. This procedure cuts the corpus callosum, which connects the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Once the corpus callosum is cut, the right and left hemisphere can no longer communicate. Patients who have had split brain procedures saw no impact or change on their personality or intelligence. This research allows us to better understand the different functions of each of the hemispheres. Researchers found that when patients were shown a word in the right visual field, the patient was able to say the word without any problem. But when words were shown to the left visual field, the patient would say they did not see see anything. However, even though individuals said they saw nothing, they could draw the word with their left hand. Once they drew the word, they could identify it because their right visual field would see the picture they drew. This is because the left hemisphere contains language. Remember, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, they're located in the left hemisphere. Two other ways in which we have gained insight into different functions of the brain is with lesion studies and autopsy. Lesion studies are where doctors and researchers will destroy specific parts of the brain to gain insight into different functions of the brain. Today, this can be done to try and treat specific disorders. Autopsies, on the other hand, is an examination of an individual's body who has died to discover the cause of death. This allows for individuals to better understand the extent of a disease, help determine the exact cause of death, and can even provide important information for an individual's next of kin. The last part of this section of Unit 2 is all about different neuroimaging techniques. Remember to complete the table in your study guide as I go through the different techniques Needs. Also, once you're done with this video, don't forget to check the answer key in the ultimate review packet to make sure your answers are correct and for more information on the different topics in this video. EEGs use electrodes that are placed on an individual's scalp. This allows researchers to record electrical signals from neurons firing, which can help with sleep and seizure research. CTs are a series of advanced x-rays that look at the brain that can help locate brain damage or even tumor. PET scans involve injecting a small amount of radioactive glucose into an individual and then tracking the glucose in specific regions of the brain. This allows researchers to see in real time which areas of the brain are active and firing. MRIs provide detailed pictures of the brain by using a strong magnetic field to cause molecules to vibrate at different frequencies. FMRIs are similar to an MRI, but they show metabolic functions. This 
can help better understand brain activity. This shows a much more detailed picture compared to a PET scan. Now 2.8 continues our discussion on the brain. Here we are focusing on how the brain can change and how it can become impacted. The ability for the brain to change, modify itself, or repair itself is known as neuroplasticity. Throughout our lives, we are constantly learning new skills, information, and growing. All of this can lead to neuroplasticity to occur. But unfortunately, we can also run into different situations which can lead to brain damage, such as infections, neurotoxins, genetic factors, head injuries, tumors, or even a stroke, just to name a few. Depending on the severity of the damage, the brain may or may not be able to recover, which can have life-altering impacts on an individual. Now, I mentioned earlier that the brain changes whenever we are learning. When we learn new information, or even when we practice old skills, the brain creates neural pathways. And the more you practice a skill or study information, the more developed the pathway becomes. Speaking of the brain, we have to also talk about an individual's consciousness. This is when an individual is awake and aware of their own external stimuli or mental activity. Individuals such as William James believed that our consciousness was a stream. It was all interconnected and you couldn't just break it into different parts. While other individuals such as Freud believed that our consciousness was made up of our conscious mind, our subconscious mind, and also the unconscious mind. With the unconscious mind influencing the conscious mind. Now when looking at our consciousness and our brain, we can see that different drugs have different impacts on our state of mind. Psychoactive substances purposely alter an individual's perception, consciousness, or mood. These drugs can be broken down into a couple of different categories. Depressants are drugs that reduce neural activity in an individual. These drugs cause drowsiness, muscle relaxation, lowered breathing, and if abused, possibly death. Examples of depressants would include alcohol or sleeping pills. Opioids also function as a depressant, but have their own category due to their addictive nature. These drugs give an individual pain relief. Example of this would be morphine, heroin, or oxycodone. Stimulants, on the other hand, excite and promote neural activity. These drugs give an individual energy, reduce a person's appetite, and cause them to become irritable. Examples of this would be caffeine, nicotine, or cocaine. Lastly, there are hallucinogens, which would include marijuana, peyote, or LSD. These drugs cause an individual to sense things that are not actually there. They can also reduce an individual's motivation and can lead an individual to panic. All right, now we've made it to the last section of Unit 2, which is all about sleep and dreaming. And if you've made it this far in the video and you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? It's free and you can always change your mind later. It's a great way to support the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when future videos get posted. Now, in talking about sleep, we have to start with your circadian rhythm. This is your biological clock. It involves changing your blood pressure, internal temperature, hormones, and regulates your sleep-wake cycle. We can look at why we sleep in a couple of different ways. The restoration theory believes that we sleep because we get tired from daily activities, and we sleep to restore our energy and resources. The adaptive theory believes that we sleep because it allows us to conserve energy, so we can save it for when we need it the most. This theory focuses on the evolutionary aspects of sleep and how it protects us and allows us to survive. Or we could look at the information processing theory, which focuses on how sleep allows us to restore and build memories. If we do not get enough sleep, we'll struggle with new information that we learned that day. When looking at sleep, we can visualize different brain waves to help us understand which stage of sleep we are in. To do this, we can use an EEG. By using an EEG, we are able to measure the frequency of a wave, which is the number of waves per second, and also the amplitude, which is the size of the wave. We can see that we have alpha waves, which are slower waves that have a high amplitude. Next is beta waves, which are low in amplitude and are the fastest brain waves. They occur when you are engaged in mental activity. Then there's theta waves, which have a greater amplitude compared to beta and alpha waves and are even slower in frequency. They are strong during times of relaxation. Lastly, there is also delta waves that have the greatest amplitude and slowest frequency. These occur when you are at your most relaxed, oftentimes during the deepest levels of sleep. When looking at the stages of sleep, we can see that we start with non-REM stage one. This is a very light sleep that only lasts about five to 10 minutes. Here, your body will start to relax and your mind starts to slow. The most common waves during this stage are alpha waves. Next is a transitional stage, which is non-REM stage 2. This normally lasts around 10 to 20 minutes. Here, an individual will experience K-complexes and sleep spindles, which are bursts of neural activity. The most common waves are theta waves during this stage. After that, an individual moves into non-REM stage 3. This is one of the deepest states of sleep. It normally lasts around 30 minutes, where growth hormones are produced and an individual may experience sleepwalking or sleep talking. The common waves during this stage are delta waves. Lastly, we have REM, which is the last stage and it stands for rapid eye movement. Here your external muscles are paralyzed while your internal muscles and structures become active. This is because your brain admits beta waves during this stage. This stage lasts for about 10 minutes. Here individuals might experience
experience dreams or also nightmares. Now before we move into dreams and sleep disorders, I want to quickly review hypnagogic sensation. These occur during non-REM stage one. This is when an individual experiences sensations that you might imagine are real. These sensations happen when you're in a light sleep. An example of this sensation would be if you were dreaming and you end up falling in your dream, only to all of a sudden be awoken suddenly with this fear that you were actually falling in real life. Speaking of dreams, we can see that there are a variety of different theories and models that seek to explain the purpose of dreams. The activation synthesis model believes that our dreams are our brain trying to make sense of random neural activity that is happening while we are asleep. The cognitive development theory believes that dreams are a reflection of our cognitive development, which is why dreams are more simple for children than they are for adults. The activation theory believes that specific areas of the brain are activated, and depending on which area of the brain is active, your dreams will have different content and contact. Lastly, the physiological function approach looks at how dreams stimulate our neural pathways and allow them to grow and also be preserved. Now, we all need sleep to be our best selves, but unfortunately, sometimes we can struggle with falling asleep or even staying asleep. We can see that many people suffer at some point in their lives with insomnia, which is a sleeping disorder where an individual will have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. This can be caused due to stress, pain, medication, or an irregular sleeping schedule. Others will struggle with sleep apnea, which is when an individual has a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep because they are struggling with their breathing. This prevents an individual from being able to get a good night's sleep and go into REM. They keep waking up due to their breathing problem. There's also sleep tears or night tears, which is when an individual experiences intense fear while sleeping, which can cause an individual to experience sleep deprivation and a disrupted sleep schedule. Lastly, even though it's rare, there is narcolepsy. Here, individuals will struggle to sleep at night and will uncontrollably fall asleep during the day. And just like that, another unit review video is done. Now you need to go back to the ultimate review packet and check your answers with the answer key. Also make sure you look at the unit practice quiz to make sure you're getting all the major concepts. Plus check out all the other resources in the packet to make sure that you're ready for your class test and that you're ready for that national exam in May. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Mr. Sin and I will see you next time online.